until the Second World War, uh, lead was in very short supply. And my father used to make what was commonly known in the family as lead stew. He had a, a <laughs> pot which he filled with lead and boiled up and then milled into lead cans. Um, I'm sure it was extremely toxic, actually, and I just thought you might like to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I can verify that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the toxic one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Adam. Okay. Sorry, can I give a question to Meredith? It's about the bonding technique. Does that eventually show up as a crack, or does it stay as if it was one piece? You, you had the fragmented glass that you bonded together and then painted. Yeah. So does that just remain like that, or can well, you still see? You can tint the adhesive as well and that's the uh, say the Hixel which is one of the adhesives it has the same when it uh, cures it has the same refractory element as light so I believe that's the word <laughs> so after time like no you c it, it's qu it depends if it's a darker glass or an opaque glass sometimes it can you know in a certain light but for the most part that that's like the top of the line that's been developed. Um, Robin, I was very interested in the um, house layout and uh, Clevedon uh, when the lead um, room was immediately off the kitchen. Um, I had all sorts of visions of lead poisoning, but you seem to be thriving, so <laughs> <laughs> take it there's not been a problem. But what, what I would like to know a little bit more about is the... Is the um, concoction, I can't give a better word, whiting and various other things that was used to... You're talking about my mother's soup. No, no, <laughs> I, 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 I'm talking about what your, what, your, what your father used between the cames and the lead. It was the final pointing mix of the glass. It was, there was whiting and linseed oil oh. and sawdust and coal dust and anything else that, that he swept up off the garage floor, I think. <laughs> Thank you. The other thing that was in the lead room right next to my mother's kitchen and her soup was the little plastic bath full of hydrofluoric acid, which we <laughs> used to rush past when we were taking some laundry to the washing machine. So it, wow. was, um, it was quite a good mixture there. <laughs> Thank you. There, there was a question oh. up here, but we're still... Glasgow has a fantastic heritage of arts crafts and particular stained glass. What uh, does everyone think holds for the future? Do you think the, you know, the, the art that, that you know, we admire just now and look on historically will flourish, grow, or do you think there's maybe a demise in, in the stained glass? Uh, I, I think it's really important. And from what I've seen, um, there's the, there is a sort of, uh, the, the, there's still demand for stained glass. Uh, we, uh, what I was trying to say about the, the story of place doesn't stop when a church stops being a regular church. The, the, place, the, the building's still important to people and people still memorialise in the same sort of way. In several of our churches, we've been approached by families who wanted to install contemporary stained glass. And what we're very keen to do is to make sure that the very best stained glass mm -hmm. artists get to install the very best stained glass in the very best buildings. And we're very keen to, Im in to encourage um, contemporary design in, in, our, in our historic churches because every generation has this ability and should uh, put their mark on these particular buildings. Mm. Peter, can I ask you mind, uh, do, uh, how do you achieve that? Do you have a kind of committee oh. of taste, if you like? Oh, the committee <laughs> of taste. <laughs> yeah. well, it's a very difficult thing to do. It um, is, yeah. Um, what we have is we do have a panel called our Conservation Committee, and I like to argue with them regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a panel of experts who, who review, but we have a governance structure in that the decisions lie with the staff, mm. actually, as to how right. these things will happen. But we, we tend to go through a process of usually these great pieces of contemporary stained glass that we've got, got, got in our building start as absolutely appalling pieces of stained glass design <laughs> and uh, go through a process mm. uh, whereby we try and encourage people to really reflect the quality 
Yes. And so it's, a, it's an ongoing process. It's a relationship, really, mm. that we try and foster. Okay. Thanks very much. What, uh, what I've been seeing recently in some of the auction houses in Scotland, and particularly Lyon and Turnbull's, is a resurgence in the availability of secondary glass. But many times that these pieces of glass are not actually sold. And what I would like to know is how can you maybe encourage the secondary use by non-ecclesiastical people in the houses and, and in new buildings, not to just get new glass put in, but And on the walls and on the staircases and on the, uh, yeah. anywhere else. Yes. Who'd like to take that? Uh, well, I think it's a, a wonderful thing if people uh, were to, to feel capable of doing that. And uh, the, the point you make, I think, is a very good one. Mm. But um, fashion seems to determine everything. And uh, the auction houses I go to, for instance, the brown furniture is pretty much overlooked these days. Mm -hmm. We're in a different period. And that whole aesthetic of, of uh, incorporating historic secondary material into a domestic contemporary interior is kind of uh, not in fashion just now. Mm. It could always come back. I think yes. probably, I'm sure it will come back. I think it's fashionable at a very high end, isn't it? Yes. You know, the, yes. the kind of Brad Pitt level. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, very fashionable, I hear. Robin? Perhaps I could just put a plug in for Glasgow City Energy Trust, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, um, a lot of uh, tenements in Glasgow uh, mm. do have wonderful stained glass windows in the common areas. Mm. And uh, we've been encouraged by a number of people who actually want to restore those windows and um, retain them. They're a really good quality um, thing, and it's something that is part of a common repair of the tenements. Um, I just. We haven't yet had anybody want to put in a new stained glass mm. window, but uh, we do support the existing ones. Is that something that you would uh, countenance? Robert? That is something that we, um, through our funding, through Histo Historic Environment Scotland <laughs> and Glasgow Council, uh, um, will offer at least a 40% um, mm. grant towards, mm. yes. I was just going to say one other thing about new glass. I mean, in the 19th, later, end of the 19th century, there were more than 80 glass um, stained glass manufacturers in Glasgow. Well, it's quite a lot. Now they're just a handful. But there are some wonderful new stained glass um, artists, but actually particularly in England, I would have said. Mm -hmm. um, people like, uh, you know, following John Piper and, uh, Piper and Patrick Renchens. I don't know if anybody's been to Salisbury Cathedral recently. It's a wonderful window, of, um, Prisoners of Conscience window there. And it's also worth looking at William Pye's amazing font, if you've ever been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of reflecting on the original question, it's, it is surely at the core of uh, conservation philosophy, the whole idea of uh, what you do uh, once the, 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 the thing has been removed from its context. So we very much start in that position where we want to encourage the, the, the product, in this case stained glass, to stay in its context because that's where it has most relevance. Uh, I think that's a really important thing to try and encourage. Again, those, uh, what I was trying to say about the story of the parish church, that every window has a story that goes far beyond the artistic endeavour. Uh, there's all sorts of stories, as you've heard, heard today. It is a terrible shame when things are removed from their context and put into an auction house and remain out of context and they're just a thing then. Um, um, uh, uh, just reflecting, we have a, an interesting situation where we've had something removed from one of our churches and now we have the dilemma of to whether to put it back again as well. Uh, mm. because there's so much time elapsed and things have changed. Um, and it's, it's quite a complex thing. I, I would encourage, I'm sure that things of great beauty always have a value to somebody, um, which is I important. But I, it's just making that plea to don't encourage people to take them out, mm -hmm. because on their own, they're not as valuable as they are in their original mm. context. Yes. That just put me in mind of something I meant, meant to say earlier, which is if... For those of you who went upstairs to the hall to look at the Webster window and the light box, you would have seen another window placed on the, on the main lancet it's call, called the artist, which I was really fascinated to see um, the artist window that, that you displayed there, because that was by McDougall, I think you said. The, 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 uh, the, almost the very similar image that we've got there was uh, sold at auction through Christie's as a cotier window purchased by... Um, a person in Glasgow who has donated it to this building where it's now
come, ba come back. So I think following the trail of an object and where it ends mm -hmm. up is a, is a really an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think, well, I completely concur that the place for an object to be is where it was designed to be. Um, increasingly, it's, a, it's going to be a problem with certain mm -hmm. buildings mm -hmm. that we're going to possibly lose, but we mm -hmm. need to preserve those objects and find a new, a new place for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. All right. Sorry. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, what I wanted to ask was uh, how much uh, with in the late 19th century would the client have an input in what the design might be? Because it, they're so complex and um, a, how much is the artist who's designing the window or is it a collaboration or, is it most, or was it mostly the artist um, who would be the instigator of the final design? Be. I can only uh, answer from some limited uh, experience. Uh, and speculation. I would have thought um, the, pic the windows I showed with William Blake in the window, I would have thought would have been with the uh, acquiescence of a patron. It's such a fundamental mm -hmm. thing to say. And, and Robin actually gave me something from his own archive with Alf Webster where the patron had listed all the, all the people he wanted, including Milton. And I wondered to myself whether if, if Blake has been an influence on Webster, he hasn't had the agreement of anyone to, 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 to literally place Blake into his window, so as an artist mm. he's perhaps incorporating the, which makes it almost more interesting for us several gen generations later to analyse his mm. window, that he's put his own uh, interest into the window without spelling, spelling these out, whereas so I would conclude that patrons have, mm. have what, maybe 80-90%, unless they have a great regard for the artist mm. and give, give, the, uh, give him the, the say in what he, what he creates, yep. which is I suppose relevant to today's commissioning. I, th I think that, sorry, Robin, in a second, but I, I just th thinking, um, you know, in terms of architecture, of course, it, it's very variable. You have someone like uh, Lord Rowallan at Rowallan begging Lorimer to design his house for him and Lorimer deigning to turn up. So the, the, every situation will be different, but I get, uh, R Robin spoke about the red letter days when the, an inquiry arrived, so perhaps you can uh, elucidate. One thing I was just going to say was that um, it's evident, I never met my grandfather, but he was a passionate man and uh, very interested in poetry and uh, could talk very well. The, the obituary in the Glasgow Herald talks about his um, powerful um, presence and what he talked about. So I think he probably inspired his clients to a certain mm, extent. Mm, mm. One, one's completely trivial, uh, the other one's a bit more serious. Uh, the first question, which is to Robin and Martin, was what on earth did your neighbours think about all of this? <laughs> um, this? The second question, which is kind of more open to the floor, is we have a tremendous amount of really good domestic space for us in Glasgow and Fields, quite a few places. But where I live in Pollock Shields, we have a tremendous amount of very good domestic stained glass, which actually undocumented, a lot of which is in villas which no one ever gets into, which you can only stumble across if you do actually have a look at houses that are up for sale and have a catalogue going with them. But a lot of it is sitting on the backs of houses so nobody ever gets to see it. A lot of it is beginning to decay. Um, their lead comes are beginning to go and you can see quite a few of the windows are sagging. What do we do about all of that? Okay, well we do question <coughs> one first. <laughs> so in terms of what the neighbours thought about our, our father's uh. activities, um, well, at Newton Terrace, um, we required Sanderson's, who had the building next door, my father required them to build an extension and glazed white brick so that his light wasn't spoilt. Um, but otherwise, I don't think we were a bad neighbour. Um, <laughs> the, the explosions from the kiln were limited. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I know that the people in Cleveland Crescent were dismayed when they thought that a stained glass factory was going to move into the Crescent, but actually my mother ran the garden club there and I <laughs> know, it, it all, all faded away. So. I presume that uh, one of the, thing, the tension, points of tension with the domestic glass in the villas and the tenements is to do with the fear that an owner might have about 
having a, a listing imposed mm. upon mm. them. Whereas if they if we could remove that paranoia, they might participate in a sort of survey you're talking about and might be encouraged mm. to do mm. that. So I, I would think that, that it would take an initiative where people were able to trust the system that they were getting involved in, that mm. they wouldn't be in any way persecuted by it. <laughs> well, that wouldn't have. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, the public inquiry I mentioned earlier concerned a villa in Polk Shields, uh, and that was trying to, well, successfully establishing that the stained glass was a fixture of the building. Now, that's important because it means you can't remove it without listed building consent. But, Neil, I think you're talking about rather un, un, unloved, uh, un, unlisted, un, undocumented stained glass. So that, that's really the, the question, how to, how to deal with that. Thanks very much. Well, I'll just say that's, I mean, that's what we're trying to do with the database of the Scottish Stained Glass Trust, and it's, it's just me working on it part-time at the moment. And, I mean, it, it takes a Ages. while. Mm. And Rachel started it. Like, you know, it's... I, or as, as soon as we can kind of speed up the process so we can have more people doing the entries, but it's like, where's the money coming from? We're going to have, we're going to need an army of interns to even make a dent in it, mm. you know, like just, we're focused on uh, not just, you know, any building. Like think of it just a city block, like every building that would have stained glass on it. Like mm. It's going to take years, like years and years mm. and hundreds and thousands of entries. So if something yet, yeah, hopefully as the system will progress, <coughs> people can make their own entries for glass mm. in their own house and hopefully the people who live in those houses would appreciate the glass enough right. to not take it out and just get double glazing. Mm. <laughs> David. David. Surely, surely it, it is the people in the houses who mm. own the houses who have to mm. end up recording and, and contributing to some sort of database mm -hmm. because the manpower is just so vast. Mm -hmm. And the, and maybe the way to, to, to get 99.9% .9 of them on board with the principle that mm -hmm. it's a fixture and not something to be removed and sold off is to is to raise the profile of the whole, mm -hmm. uh, the whole artwork mm -hmm. and Glasgow's place in, in the world in stained glass. Well, I mean, if you make them proud of, yes. proud of what they own. If they could be put on the same artistic footing as the as paintings, you know, you have the your paintings website that the BBC has created, which is fantastic, uh, is is a record of paintings all over the country. If that were extended to stained glass, um, I, th I think it would put it on the same footing and perhaps help. There are no, st there are no stained glass courses in Scotland. Just one at Edinburgh, and it's closing down. You have to go to York. Uh, uh, for for production. Uh huh. Uh, I believe there's like a, oh sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah I meant university course as yes I, is there one in Edinburgh we don't there is there, there is one in uh, Glasgow isn't there the city, yes, we city don't course, course but it's is it HND or something so yes it's, so it's not university course but, but I've heard good things about that course as well so someone from, from someone from Glasgow has to go all the way down to Sunderland or to York yeah if they want to do a degree course Amex Art School I done a, a a course at school mm -hmm. ten years ago visual communication. Yeah. I'm on this glass course. So do, do this course because the visual communication art school didn't give me the, the skills that I needed. With those skills in the Yeah, no, I yeah. creatively. I well I I didn't know very little about that course but uh -huh. I've heard good things about it. So it's learning um the process, isn't it? Just in different uh -huh. techniques. So, yeah, but why, I take that. Why, back. Not, why is there not? Why? Um, I don't know. That's. Um, I just had a friend who completed a master's um, at Edinburgh, and she was. She did her first degree in illustration, um, and went to this course because she wanted to do stained glass. And they, you know, had her come in and say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll teach you all the the kit still there, the kilns and everything." Um, but when she got there, the tutors weren't interested in stained glass and teaching. They didn't, some of them didn't know how to, so she kind of piecemealed together what she needed to know to actually make panels. Um, and I guess now it's turning into a materials course, so it's, it's just all materials. 
I have to say that there are actually a lot of practitioners in Scotland who were trained through that process from Edinburgh College. And uh, it's very sad that Edinburgh has abandoned its leaded glass. Um, it's partly, in, well, it's for a lot of different reasons, and the whole studio glass movement has kind of subsumed stained glass, whereas before it was a separate thing. But I think it does fundamentally come down to the costs of running these departments. And the great sad thing about having moved ceramics and glass into a broader spectrum means that you no longer get the marrying mm. of the technical side with the aesthetic side. And that is what people from Fra Newbury's period and right through the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s, etc., in um, both Glasgow and Edinburgh actually got, they got that coupling of the two things and I think that made much finer uh, artists, whereas now we have technicians. And uh, there is a, an important um, division here to be made as well, I think, between conservation <coughs> and original work. And yes, uh, there are um, aspects of the technical side of these uh, of this work, which is similar, but they are two very separate branches. And um, in some respects, y you need two separate approaches to create the different types of um, practitioner. Now, quite a lot of um, people like me, who make our own work as well, uh, our own original architectural work, also restore work for private buildings. And I know that I, and I have some colleagues here today who will, I'm sure, say the same thing. We work on a lot of private houses as well, so I could just respond to that comment about people who have um, stained glass in private ownership. A great many of those people actually do take a great responsibility for their windows, and they come and find people like us and ask them to rebuild them, and that is very different from the conservation issues in the great historic public buildings, and we restore them so that they are whole and and part of an existing house, so that the people can live in the house and not have leaks on their windowsills and all the rest of it. Um, so that is actually going on as an ongoing thing um, with people who have acquired skills in a traditional way. And I'm going to leave it at that. Um, yes, we, we have long had a sense that we need a centre of excellence for stained glass in Scotland. That is one of our ambitions, although we have no idea how we could achieve that. But Scotland has one of the greatest collections of 19th and 20th century stained glass in the world. And uh, I don't think Scotland realises that. Uh, it will go take all of us in the heritage building uh, arena to come together and with finding money from elsewhere, fairly large sums, to create something like this. If we don't sustain the young people learning aesthetic art and the craft, we will find ourselves without conservators as well. And we will lose the many, many windows, for example, First World War windows, whose lead has begun to peter out and which need to be restored. So, I mean, it really is something, it's our culture, it's our heritage, it's our history. We're trying to record as much as we can. We have thousands of pictures, and we've finally got our database up and running, stainedglasstrustscotland.org.uk. Meredith is just a tower of strength. She's slogging away. We do whole buildings at a time. Uh, so uh, she's just done St Giles, which I think was something like 59 windows. At the moment, we only have we can only have one picture per window, but every entry is a separate window. Uh, she's now working on St John's. We've just received pictures for 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 Lawson Memorial, which will be the next batch, and we need volunteers. We need money. We need all the rest of it. We do record private houses, but we don't make the address public. But we will see the area that's in. We did one in the grade two in the Grange area recently. So we keep a note of where the building is, but we don't make that public. Mm. Thanks very much indeed for those contributions. Can we have one final question? Yeah. This, this lady here who's yeah. been waiting very patiently. <laughs> the 
this is a comment. Uh, in the West End, in the private houses, most of the glass is either a skylight or a stair window. And unfortunately, more and more of these houses are being split up. And in particular, the stair window disappears and quite often damage is done to the skylight. But it's a question of splitting of decent-sized houses. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure if, if we can answer that question <laughs> here. It's, 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 it's a, thank you for the comments. It's much appreciated. I think that we've, we've come to the end of the day. I think it, it's been a fantastic day, full of information, passion, understanding of the subject, all brought together beautifully and I think and arranged in a very nice way as well. I, I'd like to th us all to thank now please the, the Karen and all the and Rachel and everyone who has organized this day so brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs>